Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They roll him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirits burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's come. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's come. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday, Jesus is buried, a soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a cup. As M. Lockridge wrote those words, somebody added to them, then it was Sunday. Heaven bended, God's power rended, the angels descended, the soldiers quaked, the earth shaked, the stone popped, and time stopped. It's Sunday. Christ arose, matter froze, light flashed, darkness crashed, hell reeled, Satan squealed, demons kneeled, and thunder pealed. Sin was defeated, death was cheated, and our salvation completed. Jesus ascended, the throne he attended, our sonship he extended, with lives unended. Praise God for the resurrection of Jesus. It's Sunday now, so let the sun set you free. We stand together. It's a good thing to applaud that. Good, go ahead. Let's applaud you for what Jesus has done for us. We want to sing to the other. Christ the Lord is risen today.
As we celebrate Christ's resurrection today, we appreciate those who provided lilies to help us to again celebrate and they're that yours. Make sure you pick them up after the service. In the table in the foyer, we have some resources. The, the table on the right, talking about the what Christ did, his death, his resurrection. It's meaning for us, so please pick some up and use them and read them. Just another way to reinforce what we're sharing again this morning. In the bulletin, there is an insert that we will be having a special piano concert by Sam Rotman. Uh, he's been here several times. It's on the white insert. Classical piano concert. He is a fantastic pianist. Been in like 70 some countries, 3,000 plus concerts. Fantastic story about how he came to know Christ as Savior. So that's on Saturday, April 20th. We invite you to come back to share that, that time as we can celebrate God's gift of music through him, but also what God has done in his life and how he's impacted others. So that'd be Saturday, April 20th. Ushers, would you come please so we could worship by giving of our offerings to the Lord? Let's bow together, please, to praise. Our Father who is in heaven, we are so glad we can be together this morning, that we can share together about Jesus Christ's resurrection and the newness of the life that he brings, that he can bring new life, that he, he died, he was crucified on a horrible cross, terrible punishment, and he was buried. And it wasn't just that he did the example of giving a supreme sacrifice, but it was a sacrifice for sin, sacrifice for our moral crimes that we've committed against you, and that he was the complete and perfect payment for those sins, that we wouldn't have to try to pay for our own sins. And he died in our service. He was in the tomb, but praise God that he rose from the dead, that he took back his life and he demonstrated that he is alive so that he could give us life. He could give us eternal life, forgiveness of sins, right relationship with you, right relationship with others, that we really have a reason to exist, as we've sung, that we serve a risen Savior and that he's in our world and he's in our lives. So help us this morning to continue to celebrate and just thank you for that good news. Because we know there's a lot of terrible news that's happening in our world, and even to us. But because of Jesus, we can face it in a different manner, because he gives us his love and grace and power, and he reminds us that he is with us. So God, may we celebrate Christ's resurrection, but also what it does for us, so that we can know we can go to heaven, but know that he is with us at all times, in all ways, in all circumstances. And that we celebrate again your love for us this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
The slide had a Greek word at the top, tetelestai, meaning it is finished. It's done. It's complete. There's nothing else for Jesus to do. Died and he rose again. People questioned and were wondering about that. And we have a scripture this morning about Christ's death and resurrection. It comes from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As Apostle Paul had been writing about the important things of life. So here's the first things that he preached about Christ lived, died, was buried, but he rose again and appeared. But there are some questions people had about this, and so Paul was addressing them, and people sometimes today have questions. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning verse 12, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep, have died in Christ, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be more pitied than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Because Jesus Christ is alive, we live. And we are not the most pitied people. Because it is not just for this life that we have hope, but it's beyond. Let's stand together, please, as we sing those words. I believe in the Son. It's because he lives. I will live eternally, but I also live now have full life.
Please be seated. A teacher at a Christian school liked to go over with her new students what they knew and understood about the Bible. So she was interviewing this new kindergartner and asking him some questions and found out that he had never heard the story of Jesus. When she told him about Jesus' death on the cross, he asked, what's a cross? So she picked up a couple sticks, put them together to show the form of the cross and explained that Jesus was nailed to a cross and that he died there and the boy was saddened and quietly just said, oh, That's too bad. The teacher quickly went on to tell that Jesus rose again and came back to life, and the boy's eyes got as big as saucers. Totally awesome, was what he said. You know, the boy isn't the only one to go through a dramatic change of thinking and, you know, emotions. Uh, We heard that with S.M. Lockridge, where he's talking about it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And it was evident in the story of Jesus Christ rising from the dead on that first Sunday. We're in the book of Luke this morning, chapter 24. And if you're using one of the blue Bibles in front of you in the chairs, it will be found on page 748. We're in Luke chapter 24 as we share the story of two men who were leaving Jerusalem and walking about seven miles to a nearby village just to see, well, not to see, because they didn't know what had happened. So again, Luke 24 or page 748 in the blue Bible in the chair in front of you. So we begin Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked and discussed the things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I find it fascinating that scripture tells us that these two men were kept from recognizing Jesus. You think it would be the most fantastic thing they could see at that moment? Because they'd heard some reports, but they were kept from seeing it was Jesus at this point. Now, whether that was God doing it or it was because of their emotions, the, the, the other wording says that it was basically they had physical sight, but they didn't have spiritual insight. They weren't really completely aware of what was going on. And they're not the only ones who didn't recognize Jesus immediately. Mary encountered him at the tomb, and Mary thought he was the gardener of the cemetery. Later, even after Jesus had appeared to the disciples numerous times, a bunch of them were out fishing, and they saw Jesus on shore, and 
They just thought it was some dude on the shore who's calling out to them and asking how fishing was. They didn't recognize him. So part of it is the emotional state they were in. Part of it was that Jesus had a changed appearance. Not that he was a non-humanoid or anything, but he had a glorified body. And for whatever reason, they didn't recognize him. I think most of it here that Jesus had some teaching he needed to share with them. But Jesus would reveal himself to people as he chose when they were ready. But Cleopas and the other men are dejected because of recent events, and they're flabbergasted that Jesus didn't know what had happened in Jerusalem. And the two men had a lot on their minds, and it just kind of spilled out as they're walking along the road to Emmaus. And they recounted what had taken place in the previous few days, that Jesus of Nazareth, the one that they had placed their hope in, the one who was their friend, their teacher, the one who they'd grown extremely close to, the one that they believed to be the one to deliver people from their sins, be the Savior, had been betrayed, was denied, gone through the mockery of trials, was handed over to the Roman government to be crucified, was crucified, hung on a cross for six hours, died, was buried in a cold, barren tomb, Case closed, at least because the stone was rolled away, rolled in front of the tomb, and the tomb was closed. At least they thought that was what happened place. The duo told the unknown stranger that Jesus' body was no longer in the tomb, and there were reports that he was alive, but nobody knew for certain. They didn't know where his body was. They didn't know what become about uh, become of it. They were in shock and confusion. And the disciples, in essence, were trying to teach Jesus, get him caught up about what was taking place. But it was obvious that they were the ones who were oblivious and that they were the ones who needed to be taught. So Jesus talks to them and anchors what he has to say in the scripture. And he uses the Old Testament to show where it talks about him. Some of those familiar spots to them, like Isaiah 53, where it talks about the, the lamb who was going to be slain and about what Jesus would do for them, Psalm 22. But he probably used other scriptures to point out that this is what it says about the Messiah, which is really talking about me. As they're approaching the village, it was getting late, and the disciples were going to stay there, so they encouraged Jesus to stay with them and eat, but he looked like he was going to go on. So they finally convinced him to stay with them and have a, a meal with them. Well, Jesus kind of turns the tables. Rather than being the guest, he acts as the host. Scripture tells us that he's the one who takes the bread. He's the one who prays over it. He's the one who then gives it to his disciples to eat. And so when he gave thanks for the food and broke it, their eyes were then opened and they recognized that it was Jesus. And then Jesus disappeared. There are some commentators, even good, we usually think their, their thoughts are pretty good about what the Bible has to say, that Jesus didn't just vanish, but that his new bodily form had more agility so that he could swiftly, speedily, just kind of sneakily, sneak away as if they just didn't notice him gone because, man, he's fast. <laughs> Now, I don't think that's the case at all. I think it was here one moment, gone the next, right before their eyes, he just vanished, disappeared. Like, where did he go? It wasn't like, oh, we just lost track of him. But Jesus vanished. He was gone. And the disciples instantly understood that they had been talking with Jesus. And they asked each other, weren't our hearts burning within us when we were talking with him on the road? And they realized that for several hours they had been talking with the risen Savior as he's sharing all these things from Scripture and he's there right in their very presence and they could reach out and touch him. They hurried back to Jerusalem to tell others what they had seen and, that, and what it meant to say, we've seen Jesus, meaning that Jesus is alive, meaning that he is the person who he said he is, and he could do what he said he could do. 
And then they were told that Jesus had appeared to other people as well. There was a follower of Islam who came to know Christ as his savior, and some of his buddies who were Islam yet said, well, why? Why have you become a Christian? He answered, well, suppose you're going down the road, and suddenly there's a fork in the road. It goes two different directions. And you don't know which way to go. And at the fork in the road, there are two men. One who's dead and one who's alive. Which one would you ask for directions? Pretty simple. Well, back to the story of Jesus. Here's what had happened. Jesus had been on the cross and he died and he was buried. And it seemed like death had triumphed. Jesus' body had been swallowed by earth's dark and silent tomb. And the devil likely was thinking... I did it. I've got you now. You can't escape my clutches. And for three long days, humanity seemed to hold its collective breath as the giver of life lay on the stone. No movement. Nothing happening. And though the sun rose in the east, there was a shroud of darkness over people's souls as the light of the world was hidden. The one who said that he was the gate was sealed in by one made of stone. The one who said he was the truth seemed to be nothing but a lie. The one who had said before Abraham was I am now seemed to be saying I am not. But then the earth shook. And Jesus leapt not only from the grave clothes he'd been wrapped in, but also from the devil's clutches. He ripped through the gates of hell, tore off the chains that bound people's souls. Life conquered death. Holiness defeated sin. Jesus crushed the devil. Jack declared himself to be an atheist when he was the ripe old age of, eight, of 15. And in adulthood, he adamantly defended his atheistic faith, beliefs, against his Friends, many of who were Christians, who were trying to persuade him to think otherwise and be a Christian. And he had a brilliant mind that led him to a career as a professor of philosophy and literature. But there was one nagging sticking point that Jack had a problem with. It was the book, the Bible. He admitted it was different from other literature and myths. And he was drawn to the account where God called Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses had made a lot of excuses about why he couldn't be the one to be the deliverer. And God kept countering those excuses. And the one, last one, Moses said, well, who am I going to say sent me? Now, I can't just show up. I've got to say somebody sent me. So who am I going to say is the person who sent me? God responded, I am who I am. So there's some wordplay going in there, but the main thing that God's communicating is that he's the one who's been around forever. It's his eternal presence, that he is the eternal almighty God. That particular thought affected Jack, better known as C.S. Lewis. He believed that that statement, I am, am was the only thing that the one true God needed to say. There wasn't anything more, but simply, I am. The statement changed Lewis's life, and he admitted that God was God. He hadn't placed his trust in Christ yet, but he was moving towards that to the time when he placed his personal trust in Christ as his Savior. Because of who Jesus is, he offers us God's grace, mercy, love, kindness, forgiveness, eternal life. Nothing that we deserved, but everything that we needed. Because Christ is alive, we are alive. We are free. We're liberated. Our sins, forgiven. Guilt, gone. 
shattered lives, shattered beings were made whole. Acceptance, child of God, destiny, heaven. D.L. Moody was one of the great evangelists of the late 1800s. One time he went to England to prestigious Cambridge University. The cultured and refined students were outraged and disgusted that Moody, who they considered to be a coarse, vulgar, backwoodsy American who couldn't speak the Queen's English properly, and he couldn't speak the Queen's English, they were just appalled that he would be the one to come and speak to them. So a group decided that they were going to break up the meeting. They would holler and whistle and do anything they could and mock Moody when he's preaching until Moody had no recourse except to stop. Well, the meeting began with a song by uh, Moody's associate. It said that the song touched the students' hearts. They were quieted and they listened. And right away, Moody got up and the first thing he said very bluntly, he said, young gentlemen, don't ever let anybody tell you that God don't love you, for he do. <laughs> he was backwards. He didn't know English. And he kept coming back to that statement. Don't let any, anybody tell you that God don't love you, for he do. Well, after the meeting, that phrase continued to run through one student's mind, and he thought, why do I fight a God who loves me? Why should I be in rebellion to such a God? It moved him so much that he hunted Moody down and had to talk to him some more, and Moody led him to Jesus Christ as his Savior. It was the first time that guy understood that God loved him. Some of you may be like that man. This may be the first time that you really understand that God loves you. What God did to show his love for you. That he died on the cross and rose again. You may have heard the story hundreds of times before. But this is the first time that God's really getting a hold of you and say, God loves you. Why should I fight against God? Why should I be in rebellion against him? Don't let anybody tell you that God don't love you because he do. He loves you so much that he sent the son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead 2,000 years ago is available to change lives today. To transform a person from being an enemy of God to being a child of God. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, besides being the writer of the Sherlock Holmes, served as a doctor during the Boer War in South Africa between the Dutch and the English settlers. In his book about the war, he wrote about a small detachment of British troops who were forced to retreat because they were being overwhelmed and they had to leave their wounded behind, which meant that they would face certain death. The soldiers who were left behind realized that the only way to survive would to come immediately under the protection of a red cross flag. They had a piece of white cloth, but they didn't have any paint. So they used the blood from their wounds to put it on the white cloth to make a red cross. The enemy had no recourse but to allow them to come under its protection. They respected the grim flag, and the British wounded were brought to safety. Christ shed his blood to provide a red cross for us. It offers protection and safety to all who come under its banner. We can be at peace with God and reconciled with him, and our enemy, the devil, has to honor it. There's a boy named Chad who went to school. And he was shy and sensitive and just kind of pushed to the side by a lot of the other kids. But he announced one day that he was going to make valentines for everybody in his class. And his mom knew or thought she knew what that would be like because 
as they, all the kids walked home from school, Chad was kind of pushed to the back. Nobody would talk with him. He'd just be there by his lonesome and shunned by the other kids. So she thought he'd be terribly disappointed because he wouldn't receive many, if any, cards from anybody else. But he was extremely insistent that he was going to make cards for everybody in his class. And he worked diligently on them. So on Valentine's Day, he scooped up his cards and bolted out the door. His mom decided that she would make chocolate chip cookies for him because he loved chocolate chip cookies. And when he came home at the end of the day and didn't have any Valentines, at least he'd have a chocolate chip cookie or two or a dozen that he could eat to help him. Well, she was watching out the window as kids were coming home from school and the, the group was ahead of Chad and he was straggling behind again. And the others were all laughing and talking when there was just Chad by himself. His arms were empty and she thought that he'd burst into tears the moment that he'd walk into the house. She had a hard time not crying as she greeted him and said, I have some fresh chocolate chip cookies and milk for you. Chad didn't seem to hear mom. He marched right past her and all he said was, not a one, not a one. Her heart was in her throat. Then he added, I didn't forget a one, not a single one. That's God for us. God didn't forget a single one. He knows everybody. He loves everybody. He has everybody in mind because it says, for God so loved the world. That's you, me, everybody. Everybody's included that he gave his one and only son. God's love is big enough for everybody. But some people, unfortunately, miss out. I just found this out this week as I was doing research for the message about McDonald's and their quarter pounder. Now, I don't think any of us are going to have that for our Easter lunch today, but sometimes that sounds pretty good. McDonald's Quarter Pounder ruled and reigned the burger universe for quite a while until a competitor thought, we can do something better than a Quarter Pounder. A&W decided to make a third pound burger. They ran taste test. People thought their burger was better than McDonald's burger. And was at the same price. Why not get it? But it bombed. Nobody bought the third pound burger. Seems like people were not doing the math the right way because they're thinking, okay, three is less than four. <laughs> you know where we're going. So therefore, one third is less than one fourth. So they said, Four, it's got to be a bigger burger. So nobody bought the A&W third pound burger. They missed the basics. Well, the same thing can happen when it comes to spiritual matters. People miss the basics about God loving them, making a way for them to be with him forever. They mistakenly think they are doing quite well by themselves and don't feel they need God. And others think that everybody will get to heaven, but the basics are Jesus came to live a perfect life. And you serve as the perfect and only payment that was acceptable to God to pay for moral crimes people have committed, your moral crimes, my moral crimes, the sins of everybody in the world. He rose from the dead to prove he had life and could give life to people, and people can receive eternal life by just accepting it. Jesus says, I have a gift for you. Do you want it? And you can say, yes, it's mine, and it's yours. They place their trust in what Jesus Christ is has said what he's done and who he is. See, Jesus, Jesus saves us by his death, but also by his life. And a risen Jesus lives inside of us by the Holy Spirit who enables us to live transformed lives. We all too well understand that life is full of stress, heartache, disappointments, setbacks, trials, tragedies, whatever other cinnamon, cin cinnamon, <laughs> I'm trying to make it a little bit sweeter there. Whatever synonym you want to put on it. And sometimes we think, I don't have the power to change my attitude or my outlook on life. 
I don't have the ability to break this addiction. I don't know if I can forgive this person who's hurt me. I don't have the power to love my enemies. I don't have the power to live the life Jesus is calling me to live. People walk through life carrying burden of the past failures and sin. They live in a constant state of regret. They're tortured by painful memories. They can't seem to let go of their past. And as a result, they let their past control the present and dictate the future. And they wish they could hit the delete button and start over. But we're as followers of Christ. Jesus is there and he can hit the delete button and give us a fresh start because we need fresh starts again and again and again, not just daily, but more than that. Because we serve a resurrected Savior who exerted his power to conquer death. He still operates in resurrection power and he promises to fill us with that same power. So it's not us, but Jesus working through us. Because he's alive, he gives the power to change. Gives us the power and ability to get started in a relationship with him. That's where it has to begin. But then he keeps giving that more power and the ability to keep going. To give us the strength we need to face challenges of each day as we trust him and lean into him. We can't do it alone. It's obvious. We can't do it in our own strength. We don't have the power to do it on our own. We were made to be dependent upon Jesus Christ, who has the power to change our lives as he either changes our situation or works through the situation to do in us what God is attempting to do to make us more like Jesus. He reminds us that we're a child of God because of the power of his resurrection. And we're now identified with Christ as his own child. No one else gets to have a say in the matter. God says who we are. We aren't defined by our feelings or our past or the opinions of others or by our circumstances, or by our successes, or our failures, or by the car we drive, the money we make, or the house we own. We're defined by God and God alone. The power of the Spirit in our lives sustains us through the unpredictability of life's twists and turns. It's roadblocks, and even those life-altering dead ends. Since the Lord carries us with his grace and power, we can face each day, each challenge in the strength of a risen Savior. We sang that earlier. We serve a risen Savior. He's in our lives today. And we know that he's living because he's active in our lives. Regardless of what happens to us, whatever difficulties we may face, whatever curveball life may throw at us, he empowers us to stand and to withstand. The Bible tells us that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And then it says that there's nothing, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height or depth, nor anything else in all creation, we could add, nor trouble or hardship or danger, that can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. The Lord is like a physician with his prescription pad to assure vibrant spiritual health and life and ministry. Take a big dose of my love as soon as you wake up. Swallow completely. Take more mercy repeatedly throughout the day. Take extra doses at those moments when you're feeling tempted or facing trials. Refills unlimited. No expiration date. Warning, you can become addicted to grace, but it's not a bad thing. In the early days of the Soviet Union in 1920, communist leader Nikolai Bukharin? Bukharin? Let's just call him Nikolai. <laughs> he traveled to Kiev to speak to a pro-communist rally, which was really an anti-God rally, because communism and God had nothing to do with one another. So he waxed eloquently for an hour as he extolled the virtues of communism. He berated religion, especially Christianity. And he tore at the foundations of Christianity and ridiculed it like He was a man possessed. He was greeted by just some mild, tepid applause. He felt he had done what was necessary 
to destroy all possible rationales for believing in Christ and Christianity, and then opened the floor for questions because he thought that would be another opportunity to just put down Christianity. The first to rise was an Eastern Orthodox priest. He looked at Nikolai for a little bit. Then he turned to the crowd and he spoke the Easter greeting. He is risen! The crowd leapt to its feet and responded, He is risen indeed! Bye-bye, Nikolai. He went home like a dog with its tail between his legs. That's where we are today. He is risen! He is risen indeed. We can do better. He is risen! Let's stand together and sing about that tremendous truth that he is risen. The song is Easter, hallelujah. Hallelujah being praise the Lord. Give him praise because of what he has accomplished for us.
great God, Father, thank you for your supreme love that you did not withhold Jesus, but that you sent him to earth to be born as a baby, to live life as a human, to face everything we face. So he would be the perfect payment for our sins. By placing our trust in him, we can have eternal life. We're also told that he faced everything we face so that when we are tempted, we can know that we have one who helps us, that he can give us more grace and mercy in our time of need. So we praise you for all of this, all that Jesus does and brings and continue to do for us now and will, has prepared for us in the future when we can be with him. May we celebrate that today on this Easter Resurrection Day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.